Welcome to New Watermark Photography Podcast, an international offering of Simarca de Agua, a podcast for professionals and enthusiasts to connect and share their stories. I'm Jessica Duque, food photographer and your host. This podcast is brought to you by Sigma, sigmabenelux.com Soho, Brand Studio Whiteybackdrops.com Randorhof is a well-known, talented fashion and celebrity photographer based in the Netherlands, with more than 15 years in the business. He is an educator and a book author, and works closely together with companies such as Enlinkrom, Lowepro, Sony, Manfrotto, Adobe, and many others. He is an ambassador for selected brands, as well as his own, which he founded together with his high school sweetheart, Annewick. His talent for explaining light was noticed by important companies who invited him to trade shows like Photoshop World, Photo Fair, The Photography Show, The Dutch Professional Imaging, amongst others. Nowadays, he teaches in workshops worldwide and twice a week in his own studio in Emmeloord, about one hour drive from Amsterdam. He also organizes workshops at great locations like castles, museums, and urbex locations. He has released several instructional videos with more than 15 titles about model photography, street and travel photography, and more. Frank has worked really hard to release preset packs for most raw converters like Capture One, Lightroom, and Luminar. These are real presets he uses himself and he shares them with those who loved his style. His motto is, why fake it when you can create it? Which can be interpreted as, why use Photoshop when you can shoot it right in camera? This is No Watermark Photography Podcast. Welcome, Fran Dorhoff, fashion and celebrity photographer. And yeah, this is No Watermark Photography Podcast. We have today with us an excellent photographer. I can say we're uh, we're kind of friends, right, Fran? So this is uh, Frank Hofdorf. Welcome. Without any doubt. How are you? I'm fine. It's a little bit hot, but luckily we have airco in our house, so it's doable. But as soon as you go out, with, for example, when we walk Chewy, our dog, it's like you're walking into this furnace. It's yes. it's insane. But hey, it's it's okay. So you know, time. We, we're photographers. We work in the studio and we retouch in summer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Frank, can you tell us about how did everything started with you as a photographer? It's a little bit of a weird story. You know, my mom and my dad and my grandparents were very much into photography and video. And I still remember with my grandpa being in the dark room and that he threw in a piece of paper in a bucket with stinking water and it just turned into an image. And I was going like, this is pure magic. Wow. And somehow over the years, I became very much involved into video, like just movie watching, you know, with 5.1 surround and subwoofers and everything. And I just love movies. The thing, however, that drew me into movies was that storytelling part. And of course, at one point you start doing photography for yourself. And it was just very simple stuff, you know, just around the house and with our uh, with our friends and with our company. And I think it was September uh, 9-11, actually, when we were in America for the first time. And the only thing I brought was a video camera. Mm -hmm. And the thing was that, of course, at 9-11, the world changed. Yes. And I was doing photography, but photography for me was like a second step. I was like, I, I like video more because the moving images, you can tell better stories. And then at 9-11, when we drove through Indianapolis, where we were, we saw so many devastation from people. And also the, the feeling you get yourself with something like that. And we took some video uh, just to, you know what, what you do when you feel something that's really bad? You want something in front of your face to just make that buffer between what's happening and what's entering your mind. And for me, photography and video always was that buffer. If something bad happens or something really great, you want to photograph it as a buffer between that. And I found out that later, a few years later, when you look back at the images from video, they weren't as powerful. And as a photographer, you look at those moving images and you think like, if I would have had that as a still 
with a slightly different angle, it will tell the story better. Mm -hmm. And for me, storytelling is everything. So the mistake I made was that with video, you can be a better storyteller. While in essence, photography is capturing unique moments in time that never come back again. So I, I think as a photographer, you have way more power to capture that image. That's also why I think nowadays with social media going more and more into video, I don't think if that's a wise decision because... Let me put it this way. If I mm -hmm. show you a guitar and I show you a picture of a guitar, that's way more powerful than just a video that goes around that guitar because it just... some. Let, let me put it very simple. Some things work better in video. I think when you look at storytelling, I still think photography is much more powerful when you capture that right moment. Yes. So I switched from video back to photography. And <laughs> at that point, <laughs> I joined the local photo club. Oh, and wow. that was very weird. I brought the average age, I think, down by about 25 years because I was the youngest there. And there was this one guy teaching model photography. Mm -hmm. And I did sports and birds and everything that moved. I was just going like, model photography? Nah, that's not for me. That's for, I don't know, absolutely not for me. And there was this one guy who shot a lot of nature, but he only shot trees. And he always talked about it. And it was so boring, Jessica. It was like... The worst thing ever. And you had to choose between two workshops. Go into the forest with him and shoot trees or do model photography. Okay. Jessica, I knew for sure if I would go to the forest with him, one of us wasn't coming back. I was just <laughs> going like, you know what? We're going to do model photography. And that's where everything clicks for me. I saw one, of course, a beautiful model. But hey, that's not really the thing that drew me. What drew me was... Outside, I always have to wait for the right moment for lighting. When I got the message that you can use strobes mm -hmm. and you can point them whatever way you want and you can dress up a model whatever you want, I was going like, wow. So it's not only shooting beautiful girls. It's all about a story. And it just lingered in my mind. And at that time in the weekend, we still uh, we still go every Sunday to my parents. But at that time, we always went one evening to have dinner with my parents. And my mom was preparing dinner. And this was just a week after that, I think in my mind, it was like a week after that first thing. And I was still in doubt, like, do I like model photography? Not really not, but maybe, you know, I was still very much on the edge. Yes. And there was this documentary in the Netherlands called Hour of the Wolf. And there was this documentary about David LaChapelle. Mm -hmm. And I was just looking at it and I was going like, that's not model photography, that's pure art and that's pure storytelling and i just fell in love with model photography at that point and up until today i still try to incorporate in every shot of me of mine a little bit of that storytelling part it can be a lens flare it can be uh, a cosplay outfit it can be a whole set that we build it's all about for me every image has to provoke the viewer a little bit in what's going on maybe there's a little bit more and I think that combination of being forced to do model photography um, and, of course, that part of seeing David LaChapelle, it just really, really triggered me into model photography. So that's how it all started. Wow. And um, and what about the workflow? How, how how does it look like for you or for us? It's a mess. It's No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it changes constantly. You know, um, let me put it this way. Two years ago, my workflow was actually pretty complicated compared to now i i did my let's just do a normal workshop studio so we start in the morning with the workshop um during the workshop we do some video material and then after the workshop i sit down and go through every single set and tell people tips about that set and in the past we released that as a behind the closed doors video blog and nowadays we do it as several um uh, tips videos mm -hmm. So after the workshop, I sit down, I do all the tips. And at that point, I turned around, I started up my computer and I started retouching for about two or three hours, put everything on the hard drive and went home. So that meant that I was in the studio at around eight and went home at around eight or half nine at night. Nowadays, a lot of stuff has changed. The first thing is we should tether to an iPad instead of a laptop. Okay. And, and we can do that with the cable nowadays. So that's awesome. Yes. But as soon as it's on the iPad, I just, after the workshop, I do the same video, of course, but then I go home and that's a huge difference. Now I go home, I sit on the couch and everything from the iPad, because the raw files are on the iPad, I copy into Lightroom on the iPad. Okay. I do the whole selection on the iPad while I know week is cooking. Then we have dinner. And at that point, 
I just leave it. I have a very relaxed evening. And then Sunday morning or Saturday morning, of course, when I have a workshop, I do the workshop. But on Sunday morning, I wake up, I go down, I connect my laptop to my iPad via universal control. I pick up my Apple Pencil and I start retouching on the iPad Pro connected to my uh, MacBook. Yes. This is such a huge difference in workflow. And as soon as I'm, for example, in the studio, we're using XP Pen uh, uh, tablets. So it's a display where you draw on it. It's comparable to the Wacom Cintiqs. Yes. So when I do something that's for a client that's really, really um, important, then we do it on the big computer in the studio with, of course, the drawing tablets and everything. But in all honesty, Jessica, when I compare the stuff that I do at home on the iPad Pro with an Apple mm -hmm. Pencil and what I do in the studio, the XP Pen works better. Of course, you have hard keys, you have all the selectors, but I can't bring it on the couch and sit down. And when we're traveling, I can't bring a 27-inch display with me, yeah. but I can bring a laptop and an iPad. So I think that's changed the workflow like hugely. The only problem that we always ran into was how do we get our images on the iPad Pro? Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of events and workshops. And one thing that I absolutely would never advise people to do in stressful situations is shoot wireless. Because that's absolutely the worst thing you can do. It works at home. It works in the hotel. Even better, it works five minutes before the show. Even better, it works 10 seconds before the show. The show starts and somehow, maybe it's my luck, it always craps in. It doesn't work. I get slow connections even when I'm next to the computer. So I need a cable. And up until, I believe, March this year, it was not possible to shoot with a cable, with a Sony camera, to an iPad Pro. Mm -hmm. Now, there's an app called Cast Cable. And it's, I think it's a ridiculously expensive app. It's about 86, uh, sorry, uh, 68 euros. Yes. But it works like a charm. We just connect the USB-C cable. We connect it to the camera. The camera charges via the iPad Pro. It's not something I would advise, unless the iPad Pro, is, of course, is also powered. And the transfer is blazingly fast. So now on location, I only bring my iPad Pro. No laptops anymore. Only the iPad Pro. And a week has the Apple Pencil with her in her back. We do the whole workshop on location or the whole shoot on location. And a week drives back. And in the car, I'm already selecting images, retouching half of it. I come home. You can do it on the restroom. You can do it on the couch. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's such a huge difference. I can now do twice the workload I do before. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the workflow changed a lot. And that also means that, of course, your software has to grow. Like, for example, in the past, when you wanted to do skin retouching, you needed a filter like, for example, image genomic portraiture in Photoshop. So you always needed Photoshop. When you look now what Adobe is doing with Lightroom with local adjustments, they a year or two ago already, they added, for example, clarity, structure, and dehaze in local adjustments. And that makes it so easy to do skin retouching in Lightroom. I'm not going to say it's the same as a professional filter, but, oh, it comes so incredibly close. And for most images, and you have to realize that, right, not every image is a $1 million shot. None of the images is, by the way, but okay. Mm -hmm. But not all images are meant for uh, publicizing on big billboards. Most of the images just end up on Instagram, on uh, in a video on YouTube, or on your social media. And let's be honest, if you do the skin retouching in Lightroom, there's nobody, literally nobody, that will see a difference online. So for my clients' work, I will still use Photoshop. Yes. All the plugins and filters, I will do it myself with Dutch and Burn, and I will use the XP Pen tablets because they are more color accurate. And of course, the BenQ monitor on top. So I'm always looking at my monitor and retouching on the XP Pen because the monitor is hardware calibrated. Yes. But in all honesty, when I compare it to the work I do on my hobby workflow, it's it's getting so close. It's getting so incredibly close. And well, I switched from Windows back to Mac only for mm -hmm. universal control. Yes. And that's a game changer for photographers. That's a real game changer. Yeah, definitely. Because I have heard from Edu Lopez in our uh, Spanish uh, podcast that he's also using for his wedding photography and for all his photography, the iPad Pro and also Renko Procaccio. He, uh, excuse me. He's a photographer in Chile and he's uh, focusing in restaurant and uh, food photography. And he's also, uh, he said, I I'm not using any computer. I'm just no. using my iPad Pro. It's like for real. Like, and then you. 
I cannot believe that all those photos are made with a, with an iPad Pro, well, with a camera, but you know, all the retouching and processing with the iPad Pro. That's amazing. You know, it's, and this is the thing that, and I really want to stress this. You hear so many times, I can't believe it's done with a Sony. I can't believe it's done with an iPhone. I can't believe it's all about the picture. If a picture grabs you, it's there. And do remember that in the past, guys like Affedon and Newton and all those great photographers, I think about George Harrell even further back, they didn't have Photoshop. Well, they did. They used the darkroom. Mm -hmm. They didn't have Photoshop. They didn't have Boris effects for light, for lens flares. Amazing software package, by the way. We're testing that at the moment. And all those guys, they pulled off images that nowadays we look at. When I, when I would post an image like George Harrell, the first thing people say to me, what filter did you use in Photoshop? And I go like, no, no, we did this with a Fresnel and we did it with Flex. And no, no, but I mean, afterwards, how, how do you get that look? Uh, yeah, we, we converted it to black and white. No, 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 Frank, you don't get it. How do you get that light that there's just a shimmer of light there and it's like the light has form? Uh, yeah, we use Flex. Oh, what filter is that? No, it's on. Set. And you have to repeat it like 10 or 20 times that you yes. really did it on set. Yes. And yes. I think when you look at the old days, uh, like I love vintage lenses, like M42s. As soon as they see bright light, they go like, no, no bright light. And they start to lens flare. And somehow in modern day cameras, you have all these lenses that are coded for UV, of course, and coded against lens flare. Now, this is a great thing because you don't have lens flares anymore. But it's also a really bad thing because you don't have lens flares anymore. And lens flares are so amazing when you do it right. So when I started experimenting with the M42 lenses and I got these beautiful lens flares in my images, I was so frustrated that people kept asking me like, how did you get the lens flare in? Is that uh, alien skin exposure at that time? Now it's exposure software. Is it DxO? Is it... No, guys, it's an old freaking lens that I bought for five euros on a flea market. <laughs> yeah, but how did you get that lens flare in? It's that lens. And now, luckily, nowadays, we use a filter called the Black Mist filter from Key F Concept. So you have it in different strengths. One eighth we use for video, one fourth we use for every day. And then sometimes in the studio, I use one two when we have a big set and I want the lens flare and the strobe is a little bit too far away. That's when I actually use the one two. And you um, automatically, you keep all your sharpness, but you get these beautiful highlights that are blooming and getting lens flares. And luckily, nowadays, when we have a filter, I can also show people in a video, like, okay, guys, look, click. This is without. Click. This is with. This is stronger. Click. And now people go like, ah. So you don't need Photoshop. No. <laughs> no. Photoshop is awesome. I love Adobe. I love Photoshop. I use it every single day. But... It's the way that you use Photoshop. I use Photoshop for everything that I can't do in camera. Mm -hmm. Like we're now testing with Boris FX and uh, we shot an image with a witch uh, during the workshop this weekend. And I'm still retouching the image, but it's a different way of working. Like when I normally take a shot in my mind, the shot is already done and I only have to take the picture and then just fine tune it in Photoshop. I'm now also shooting part of my images, maybe 5% in the future. I'm starting differently. I'm just shooting it. I'm placing lights, but I don't really care about getting that lens flare perfect anymore. I still want part of my shots, 90%. I want to still freak out over getting that lens flare absolutely right. But slowly I'm starting to do 5%, like get it as right as possible. Yes. And then use software like Boris FX to create more like a surreal look. Yes. And I think when I look at all the guys that do compositing nowadays, there are some that are awesome, that are just, I look at it and go like, wow, this looks real. And I see a lot where I go like, okay, that's a composite. That's a, that's a layer. That's a layer. That's a, I don't know for sure, but I think that's a layer. And I think software like Boris FX can be overused. Like, for example, I have a shitty image. Let's Instagram the heck out of it, throw some Boris FX on it, and wow, look at this. Yes. Or you can get photographers that really know what they're doing and they just use the effect very, very sparsely just to get a little bit of extra lens flare, turn on a little light. Or when you have a candle and it's too dark because you're using strobes and the shutter speed can't be two seconds, of course, 
maybe one second max, just get that lens, it's th that flame just a little bit better. Give it a little bit more omnidirectional lighting. And I think Boris FX software, if you use it very, very slowly or very low, mm -hmm. I think it's hardly unrecognizable in a shot or over the top where you can see it. So I think that's great for, for the future of photography, but get it in camera right for 99%. Yeah, that that is that is the thing that I also tell the you know the food photographers like okay how do you do that how do you uh, make that light and it's like everything is on set I try to yeah. work as clean as possible and try to get my lights like right and then the time in Photoshop it will be like minimal just for like maybe one uh, thing that I don't want there maybe a, a sprinkle or something yeah. but not to you know change the whole image I, I want to work clean and neat from the very beginning and you know get the right shot like like you said so it's the same so I get photographers like say yeah don't worry okay they say Jessica tell me uh, tell me something about my, my photo and then like okay you need to work a little bit better the, the positioning of the lights and no 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 don't worry I'll work that later on photoshop it's like no. mm, well good luck yeah but you um make, you I'm you can make it great in Photoshop. Let's be honest. I have some yeah. images on my phone, which the behind the scenes images I take during the workshop. I shoot them with a Samsung Galaxy uh, S22. And yes. before that with the Sony uh, smartphone. Great cameras in those two ca uh, smartphones, by the way. And I just shoot it on night mode. That's the reason I switched back to the Samsung, because the Sony doesn't have a real night mode. And I use that a lot. And the images that come out are, sorry for the expression, they're crap for yes. a photographer. Because... But they're awesome. And why are they crap and awesome? They're crap because all the magic of the studio is gone. It's a high definition image, uh, 10 megapixels. So it's pretty high in resolution for internet, of course. We're shooting 60 megapixels. But for internet, 10 is more than enough. But it's everything is clear. So there's no blown out highlights. There are no blocked up shadows. So it looks like an HDR shot with tone mapping. But those images... Those are the images that we run through some filters in Lightroom and make them more interesting. Yes. With those images, it works. But you can never add accent lighting uh, in Photoshop. You can do it, but it will always look a little bit fake. Yes. And you can never add lens flares in Photoshop mm. unless it's there. You can enhance a lens flare, and that looks totally believable. But if there is no light there and you put in a lens flare, it just, I don't know. For me, it just looks incredibly fake unless it's really well done. Yeah. And then I go like, why spend so much time? Just put an extra strobe in there and you're done. Copy yeah. that strobe to another location and bingo. Yeah, it's like uh, we had in a Spanish post, uh, podcast, one of the episodes with um, Giancarlo Pawelek. You know him very well. And he's uh, we, we were talking about uh, photography, uh, automobilistic photography. And then I asked him, okay, how do you do it? How do you control the, the reflex and this and that and the curves and all the details? And then he explained it to me like, hey, Jessica, some photographers, they take the photos like part by part and then get them all together in Photoshop. But I'm old school. I'm an old school guy. So I do my whole thing. And, you know, the Photoshop is just the minimal thing that I have to do. But nowadays, things that they look alike, like a render. So it, it doesn't look like natural or beautiful or realistic. But, you know, depends on the client, depends on the photographer. Everything is valid. So... That's you you know, the weird thing, a lot of photographers don't even realize that you can get polarizers for your filter, for your for your strobes. Exactly. And that solves so many problems. And I recently talked to somebody that does uh, art reproduction and he does the same thing. He shuts it in different angles, then copied everything into Photoshop and angled it back. I said, how much time do you spend on that, dude? He said, oh, it's a lot of time, but we don't want that glare in the paintings. And you know, angle of incidence is angle of reflection, right, Frank? So yeah. we can't shoot it straight on. I yeah. said, did you ever hear about polarizers? And he said, yeah, those you put on your lens, but that won't work. I said, no, you can also put them on your strobes. Oh, wow. And I didn't said, know that. I, was, I use it for my lens. I also didn't know that. But I, there's a book out, and I highly recommend every photographer in the world to read this book. It's very, very old. It's, it's almost from the Middle Ages. I'm just kidding. It's called <laughs> Light Science Magic. Uh -huh. I read the book from top to cover, and one of the chapters actually explains how you use polarizers on strobes. And now imagine this, when you shoot a car, there's always a reflection, right? Yes. Use a polarizer on that strobe, and you polarize the light, and the reflection is gone. Now, I'm not going to say it's easy. It's easier in Photoshop, but somehow, where's the challenge? Yes. You know? The challenge is taking a picture, and it's right, it's right straight away. 
So he's now using um, still his own technique. And I never use polarizers on strobes. I just read it and I know it's possible. But he's still going on. And mm -hmm. I, I just don't get it. It's somehow, I think it's a workflow that's too much stuck to somebody. Uh -huh. And they're just too afraid to change it. Like when I changed my workflow to the iPad Pro, I kid you not, Jessica, the first two months I was cursing and I never, I didn't really <laughs> curse, you know, but I was more like, ah, crap. And <laughs> Nothing worked, but that's usual. Of course, you go from a big XP pen tablet to a BenQ calibrated monitor with a big setup with a chair where you sit and you go on the couch with an Apple Pencil and an iPad where all the software is still in development. Of course, it's not going to work the same. Yeah. But first I got 50%. And then after about three or four months, I got up to 70%. And now I'm up to 95%. And mm -hmm. with workshops, I'm at 100% now on the iPad Pro. So take some time to change over to the new workflows mm -hmm. and just keep it open and change. I think when he shoots art with polarizers, his work is very easy. He just put it up, takes a shot next, and he doesn't have to do anything in Photoshop. Right. So let's go back to your uh, inspiration and yes. how, okay, who are your mentors? Who were your mentors mm -hmm. or, or the people you follow for, for inspiration? Where do um, you find your inspiration? The inspiration I find literally everywhere in movies. Uh, look at the new Batman movie with Patterson and look at all the tinting they use and all the styling and backlighting. It's insane. It's You have to watch the movie twice. One for the story and the second one, on, maybe even turn, no, don't turn off the music, but just look at the gorgeous lighting and tinting they use. It's insane. Okay. So from early on, I think my main influence is movies. That's also, if you look at my portfolio, I mostly shoot landscape. Yes. And think about movies. They're always 235, 185, yes. academic standard. You never see a movie in portrait no, mode. No, no. It doesn't no. make sense for me to shoot a, a portrait in, in, um, in portrait mode for the very simple reason. Everything is now the model. Yes. No, I want the model to breathe. I want negative space. And I still want to start a campaign. Not negative space, but positive space because that it explains. really adds something <laughs> to the image. And now at school, everybody's thought that's negative space. And when I tell you, you are negative, is that something positive or something that you have to work on and don't use? But negative space in photography is so freakingly important. Why do yes. we give it a name like it's crap space, it's damned space, it's the bad space? No, it's positive. Take the negative space away and your image collapses. So, so photographer movie. says that uh, when you when you uh, when you have like so much negative space, it's because you don't know how to compose in food photography. Yes, then it's negative. If you use the negative space too big, it becomes negative. But if you know how it works, it's very positive. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, exactly. And I think when I started with photography, I think my main influence at first was David LaChapelle, without yes. any any doubt. Then we found the Dutch photographer, of course, Erwin Olaf which mm -hmm. is, in my opinion, still a little bit uh, in that same category. Yes. Of course, then you get Annie Leibovitch. And at one point, I was a little bit burned out when I saw Annie Leibovitch working because she has a team of 20 photographers around them. And in all honesty, I don't, I don't know Annie Leibovitch. But when I look at her images, I really wonder, does she really do everything herself or is it more the team and sees the name connected to it? Right. You, you have certain bands, you know, and they release a studio album and that's awesome and you see him live and you go like what the heck did they play on that album and then you read the signatures in the album and you see the band consists of uh, frank and jessica guitar and you see a totally different name because they use different artists to play most of the parts in the studio so they yes. sound great and then they start playing live and I, I think a lot of photographers they produce amazing work and guys like us that go like uh-uh I just drop the camera, mic drop, I'm done. Uh, then when you look at it, it's not the photographer that takes the shot. It's 20 no. people helping her. Exactly. It's 10 people retouching. And then it gives you a little bit more breathing room. Okay, maybe I can do it. So I started going into the older photographers. Like, okay, let's take that whole retouching part out. Who do we have left? And then you go to Afadon with his amazing photography. Then you go to Helmut Newton, which really broke barriers down. And then you go even further back, George Harrell. If you yes. really want to see Hollywood lighting, George Harrell, without any doubt, one of the masters. And then you slowly start to realize that when you master 
small light sources, hard light, harsh lighting, and you master that, a softbox is so incredibly easy. Yes. So during the workshops and also during the tutorials, I mainly focus on controlling those old time photographers lighting. So harsh light using uh, flags. We recently got the uh, Lindsay Adler Westcott projector, for example, with the blades. Yes. Oh my, that opens so many possibilities. We tried an older, uh, an other alternative in the past, like a Gobo projector. And although I liked it, those blades, I, I wouldn't advise any Gobo projector different if they have blades, because otherwise you're always stuck to the Gobos. Yes. And the Gobos are nice, but you always have the same patterns. And when you have blades in a projector, you can literally just go, okay, now I want a triangle. Okay, now I just want a shiver of light. Just look at the just look at the images of Lindsay Adler while she works with it. It's an amazing tool to shape light. So flags, harsh light, a projector like the Westcott projector with, with uh, blades, and you really start to control lighting, even for food photography. You could, for example, yes. think about this. You have a nice hamburger, right? You have mm -hmm. a big softbox. That's a boring shot. Yes. Why not throw in one extra light, one stop above, lower your main light one stop, so everything becomes dark, and then use a projector with, for example, those blades, and just make a shiver of light over the leadage with a little bit of water, yes. one stop above. Nobody will see that there's one stop above, but it's what you mostly do in Photoshop, just dodge a little bit. How cool is it if you can do that with lighting? Yes, that's amazing. I'm currently obsessed with uh, our light. And also with shadows and gobos and stuff, so uh, I'm I'm more uh, into that. Uh, how do you say? I I, I like to call it like non-perfect, uh, you know, food photography. I'm just like trying to play around with colors and hard lights, and you know, modern. I I, I got bored of it, the perfection. Don't call it non-perfection, modern, because if you say non-perfection or sloppy, people go like, no, it's not good. No, You're no, probably no. doing something better because you're making it more lifelike, more extreme, more engaging to the people. Yeah, I, I really got tired of the, you know, the beautiful, uh, you know, thing of eating. Like, no, that's not how it's life. I never, real. I hardly ever go to McDonald's, but I always <laughs> tell in a week, the next time I go to McDonald's, I'm going to make a picture. I'm going to yeah. make a picture of an hamburger that I buy next to the hamburger on the screen. And then I'm going to go with a meme. You say that fashion photographers retouch a lot? I don't think so. Well, let me tell you, here in the Netherlands, I have seen uh, recently the, the, the latest McDonald's campaign. The burgers mm. are more like, you know, less less perfect. They're like a little bit tilted and there's some letters on, you know, on the on the stage. So it is like, mm, they're, they're probably uh, going for the more realistic look. Because they don't have know. money for paying the real photographers like you. <laughs> No, literally, I, I was approached by, um, I, won't, I won't say the name, but they're red in letters and they sell a lot of media uh -huh. and they're like a market place. Mm -hmm. And they asked me like, okay, Frank, we want to do a commercial uh, with um, people in the store just shaking hands and looking at gear, mm -hmm. but we can't use our own personnel. We need models and they need it for, I believe, 10 different um, locations. So it gave them an offer, which actually... To go in the Godfather terms, they couldn't refuse. It, it, I really wanted to do the shoot, and I did it as low as possible. So, for example, the models, I only charged 100 euros for a full day. Okay. That's insane, but I knew some people that really wanted to do it with me. I got an answer back. I said, okay, yeah, that's a deal. I said, okay, so let's see in what location we can start. Yeah, you can start in Amsterdam. I said, okay, so... And I, I gave them the invoice, like everything they said. So Amsterdam, Rotterdam, uh, Groningen, whatever. So they literally let me drive all over the country. Groningen, it's on the top. Amsterdam is somewhere in the middle. And they also had something in Brabant. And then they realized that my offer was per location. So imagine this. In the end, I calculated it back. After taxes, after hourly work, I would have kept, and don't be alarmed, for 10 locations, mm -hmm. my total revenue after paying my models and doing taxes would be minus 25 euros. So I'm in the end, I'm glad they didn't accept it, of course, because then you always have this part, like if you pay more than they think, they would go like, I don't like this image. Can you do it better? Can you do this? And that's the expectation of the client. Yeah. The client thinks that photography can be done for 100 euro per location, including three models, travel from the photographer, 
and you give away all your rights to the images. They just don't realize that we also have to earn money. We also have to uh, pay taxes and we also have to pay insurance. Yeah. And I think that when you look at photography nowadays, I always call the term excitement. When was the last time you were really excited when you saw an image in a magazine? And for me, that was a long, long time ago because modern day photography, especially commercial photography, it isn't that interesting anymore. You see a lot no. of mistakes. I recently opened up a magazine, a high-end magazine, and they did an interview with three BNRs. And BNRs are famous people in the Netherlands. So in other words, they don't do anything. They're just famous. And they shot him against a gray backdrop. Jessica, I kid you not. I showed it to Anna Week as he said, this is terrible. So we have two pages with four or five people all shot against the same gray seamless backdrop. How easy is it with a gray seamless backdrop for guys who don't know it you take your color picker if you don't use a color checker you go on your gray seamless you click and you have a proper color balance and yeah. you do that every single day and you're actually dumb because you should use a color checker but anyway you have the proper color now imagine this you have the photographer you have the art director you have the guy that makes up the pages mm -hmm. and then you have the offset printer and then you have also a final check how in the world, is it possible that when I open up that magazine, that I can literally see who came in on the same day? And you know how I could see who came in on the same day? Because there were only two pictures that were the same in color in the backdrop. The other one was way too blue. The other one was way too red. This is something that is paid for by a great magazine. Mm -hmm. It's insane. And you know how it was probably done? Hey, do you have a camera? Yeah, but I'm an intern. Oh, that doesn't matter. We have somebody coming in. Can you please shoot it against that backdrop? And then the next day, somebody else shot it. If that was a professional photographer, I would have immediately shamed, shamed myself to the floor because that's five images with only two backdrops that look the same while it's gray seamless. So, Jessica, it's not about being less nice with your images i really think that nowadays there is no budget for photography anymore so people no. are just satisfied with just send me an image i'm fine yeah i know that <laughs> yeah but the thing is like i don't like commercial photography and i remember with the last job i took for a for a very important brand here in the netherlands uh because i work for advertising first in amsterdam i work for uh for the mcdonald's account mazda as a graphic designer when I took this job and I did a couple of, uh, you know, photo shoots for them, I said, now I remember why I didn't want to work for this field anymore. I didn't want to work for commercial. So it's like, no, I like to work, you know, at my studio, you yeah. know, with my own freedom, with my own creativity, because I don't like the micromanagement. The people tell you what to do in terms of uh, creativity. So that's also, not a, a way to do art. It's just like, just make a picture, you know? And, you know, and I actually, ask some questions about, okay, how do you uh, want the style of the picture? And it's like, no, like freestyle, but okay, what is freestyle? Like, okay, show me something about how is freestyle. freestyle you, you like, like control mess. You like, like everything like neat and clean, light and airy. No, just like make the picture. So it is like, thing, really like disappointing. make magic. Yeah. But what do you mean with magic? I, I don't know. Just make magic. Okay. Then you show <laughs> something that's magic. No, no, that's not magic. That's more. I don't know, but it's not, ma tell yeah. me what you want. And I think my main frustration was at one point I was shooting for a magazine and I was their staff photographer, staff photographer, not star, but staff photographer. So there were yes. two photographers and I was the one that did all the work. And at one point I started to get more and more uh, assignments from the owner, which he liked. And at one point I did a shoot for a cover and I gave him four images and I said, you know what? Those four images are for the article. There's one image that I absolutely don't want on the cover, but it's what you wanted. So I did the image, but I, I don't want it on the cover. I, I think it's a horrible picture, but it's what you wanted. And that ended up on the cover. And to tell you the God honest truth, uh, two months later, the magazine went bankrupt because nobody bought it anymore. Wow. And Anna Week and I both said, Oh my God, thank you so very much that it went bankrupt because now I don't have to shoot for him anymore because we had an assignment for two years, which I signed. Mm -hmm. And during that period, I also started shooting more with Vibi Suyadi, that piano player in the Netherlands. And somehow when you shoot somebody that's a celebrity, people think that you're a different photographer than you are. And guys, listen to me. 
if you shoot a famous person, it doesn't make you a better photographer. It just means that you have a great network. And it doesn't say anything about the quality of your work. So don't look up to those guys that shoot Michael Jackson or that shoot yeah. Queen. They're probably worse photographers than you guys, but they just have the network. Yes. I started shooting BB and a lot of people did like my work because my work, okay, it is okay. And they started doing like, Frank, do you teach workshops? And I think this is a pivotal point. I didn't want to do workshops because in my opinion, to teach a workshop, you need to be a master in photography. And even today, I'm far away from being a master of photography. I just do what I like. And I know pretty much everything about when you tell me something, I'm like a human copying machine. I can probably emulate every style there. Mm -hmm. And I understand it. But when I look at my own work, I still think I'm in the mediocre factor. I no, 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 shots, no. But but stop I'm right okay. there. Can, can we talk about how do you define your style? Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. Yeah. So when I started doing the workshops, and this is the, the pivotal point, I think, I started to look at photographers online that taught workshops. Uh -huh. And the only one I could find that I really liked was Joe McNally which was with speed light. So it wasn't really my thing. And I found somebody called Dean Collins. Yes. Dean did pass away and I never met him. And I still regret it to the day because up until today, if you start with photography, even if you are 100% not interested in model photography, commercial photography or whatever, lock yourself up in a room and watch every single video you can find from Dean Collins. He explains stuff so incredibly simple. Like talk about the light meter. When you look online, there are videos that talk about, mm -hmm. I don't use a light meter because a model isn't 18% gray. You don't understand the light meter because when you use your camera, you're shooting an 18% gray model. When you use an incident meter, you're using light falling on the meter. Now, up until that point, I was still confused about the light meter. Where do I point the freaking thing? Because one photographer said pointed towards the camera. That was very clear. That was not the right way. And another one told me, point it towards the strobes. That worked for most of the time. But when I want, was outside and the sun was behind my model, pointing towards the camera works. So I was confused, like, why? Dean Collins just sat down. And his first video, he explained to Light Meter, he said, it's so overcomplicated by people. And it's so simple. It's a uh -huh. light meter that meters light hitting the meter. Hold it in front of the area you want correctly lit, dummy. Just hold it for the area you want correctly lit. So in strobe land, so in uh -huh. studio land, that always means point towards the main light source because why the heck is the light source otherwise there? Oh. But outside, when you have the sun behind your model, hold it in front of the area you want correctly lit. Aim it towards the camera dummy because you want that part lit. So you don't aim it anywhere. You just hold it. And that little change in sentence, yes. instead of pointing, hold it. His videos are filled with that kind of little changes in wording where you can really see that he understands lighting. He understands what he's doing compared to somebody that saw a video, thinks he understands it and explains it the wrong way. Recently, there was a video online uh, about the inverse square law. And you have like 100,000 views and 50,000 people or 5,000 people. I don't. It was a lot of people responding. Finally. It is explained in a way that I understand. You know how he, uh, how he explained it? How? If you double the distance, you get double the amount of light. That's wrong. The inverse square law literally says it. Square, fourth. So it's not double the light by double the st distance. It's a quarter. And 5,000 people say, finally, I understand it. It's in the name, guys. <laughs> and that's what I don't. <clears throat> don't like about YouTube and I don't like about internet. There are a lot of people shouting stuff that don't really understand it. And what happens with new photographers, they start they start to be confused. Do I really need a light meter? I was on a trade show where somebody said, I never use a light meter because I yeah. always underexpose by half a stop because I like that look. So I was in the audience. So I put my finger up. I said, how do you know how to underexpose by half a stop if you don't use a light meter? And he didn't have an answer for that. He was just going like, yeah, I know, uh, from experience. I said, okay, so you look at the strobe, F16, let's go down half a stop. Yeah, yeah, exactly like that. I said, okay, so you never retouch in Photoshop. Yes, of course, I use the exposure slider. You don't get it, right? Get a light meter. If you always underexpose half a stop, meter it at 11, at 0.5 on your strobes, and shoot it on F11. And then you overexpose half a stop, 
If you want to underexpose, shoot it on F11, but put your strokes five clicks down. So you can go, you can go both ways, but that light meter just makes you faster. And that inspired me to start teaching. Like, okay, if there's so much confusion, let's just try it one time. And this is, that's why I told it the pivot point. I started to like it so much because when you get a like on an image, that's cool, right? But yes. after two seconds, you're done. You're like, okay, you like the image. <laughs> but when you teach somebody new techniques and new ways of looking at photography and looking at lighting, you get so many mails from people. You totally change the way that I look at lighting. Everything goes easier now. And I'm smiling for a week. And I teach twice a week, so I'm smiling all week long. So that's the reason that uh, you became an educator. Because for yeah. me, I believe you're a natural. I mean, when you explain things, it's like, okay, uh, this this whole episode is a masterclass for me. To oh, be thank you so very much. <laughs> it's masterclass. Okay, and let's talk about your go-to gear, Frank. Yeah. What is uh? What are your essentials in your uh, photography backpack? Okay, the essentials. Um, yes. Let me put it this way. In the studio, we're using Hensel strobes. Yes. And the choice I did for Hensel is very simple. Um, price, quality. I think they, together with Ellingrom, Hensel and Ellingrom are for me the two brands that really deliver the pricing you pay. Uh, I think Hensel is a little bit better for me because uh, they're a little bit faster with freezing motion. Yes. But I still, when somebody asks Ellingrom, Hensel. Then you have Profoto. And I think Profoto is great, but it's a little bit overpriced and underperforming for what it delivers. Mm -hmm. So I still am more leaning towards Hensel and Ellingrom. In the lower part, you have Hodox, which does great. They have a great multifunctional package, but I wouldn't advise that to a professional photographer. So Hensel for me in the studio is the main gear. What I really can't live without are grids because I want to control that lighting. Camera-wise, I'm using Sony. Yes. And the only reason I'm using Sony is for the very simple reason. They were the first one with a proper working EVF. And what you see is what you get is very important for street and travel photography, which I love to do. Yes. And I just think that at the moment, Sony is at the forefront of sensor technology. And they are increasingly performing their cameras better and better. And it's just an insane brand. So I'm totally happy with them. But you can also make great pictures with um With your smartphone. It's about yes. capturing the moment. It's not about quality. If you have a great shot, quality doesn't really, it does matter. It doesn't really. <laughs> yeah, but when you are printing, I mean, yeah. if you're doing a photo for outdoors, uh, you know, advertising, yeah, it matters. Yeah, of course. Well, monitor-wise, I'm using BenQ monitors because they are hardware calibratable. And again, it's a price matter. I'm Dutch. So you can yeah. go for ISO, but you pay a lot more for a monitor. And there's one thing, and... When you talk about masterclass, you like the technical part. Yes. I'm an ISF trained engineer. So that means that I am uh, qualified to do proper calibrations for also high-end materials. Yes. When I look at ISO, they have their calibrating tool inside the monitor. Yes. In a corner. Now, ISO always told me like, okay, we have a program uh, that actually calculates the decline of the panel and the decline of the analyzer and it's calculated. That isn't true and that can never be true. An analyzer is a three stimulus meter. So that means they have gels or glass that deteriorates over time. The same thing happens in your screen. An LCD panel degrades over time. So that means that if you have an analyzer that degrades and a panel that degrades, you can never fix those two together. Whatever they tell you, it's a lie. It's not possible. What I like about BenQ is that they understand that mm -hmm. and that they actually say, no, we have hardware calibration inside the monitor. And you buy any analyzer you want that can be a Calibrite or X-Rite, that can be a Spider. I have a Spider. After two years, you replace your analyzer and the monitor will always be up to date. Yes. I worked with both monitors and both monitors perform great. The only thing is you pay by ISO for the calibration tool inside, which after two years, in my opinion, is not good enough anymore for professional work. And with BenQ, you pay less for the monitor, a lot less. You get same performance. And you get hardware calibration with an external analyzer. And I think that's a big plus for me. Yes. And retouching, I love using the XP pens. I had a lot of problems with Wacom with uh, parallax errors on the older Cintiqs. And uh, somebody sent me an XP pen and I never looked back. It was just an amazing piece of kit. And then let me see. Then we have... Um, lenses. Lenses. I think in the past I used the 7200 a lot. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I just, it clicked. I went to the 24 to 70 for a very simple reason. When you shoot at 70 to 200, everything is compressed. 
Yes. So at 70, it's compressed. At 200, it's compressed. When you, when you use a 24 to 70, at 70, you can create a beautiful portrait with bouquet on the back. It's amazing. It's a compressed portrait. But you can also go back to 50, which I think is something that I hardly ever use. I also never use 50 millimeter lenses. It's not wide enough. It's not tailor enough. I don't know. But with the 24 to 70, I can go from 70 to 24 and I have a wide angle. So now I can sit on the floor, make my model look majestic and I don't have to change lenses. So mm -hmm. the 24 to 70, uh, the filter that I use on all my lenses are is the black mist filter from KNF. It has little black nano dots and it sounds like a commercial. It's not. But what it does is it it blooms the highlights, but it keeps all the sharpness in your image. And that's yeah. a big plus, because if I don't have backlit subjects, I don't see the filter on my camera. If I have backlit, the filter starts to work. So it's like it's always in standby until I need it, then it works. Okay. So after that, of course, we have to make sure that those images get on the computer, right? So I'm using an iPad Pro or a laptop yes. uh, on location or in the studio. And... One of the main things for me is tethering. And this is a part where we are very, very uh, educated in because we are doing tethering for over 15 years. Believe yes. it or not, we started literally out with that yellow cable. Yes. And I had a CRT television that I actually turned upside down. It couldn't be long for that time because it started to uh, decolorize. But we started with that yellow cable because very early in my career, I, I started to realize that everybody that looked over my shoulder like, can I look at that image? That was so incredibly <laughs> no, frustrating. Yes. So it was like, I have to get that image off my camera onto a big screen. Yes. There were no solutions at that moment. So we started using video cables and I was so happy with it. Then I switched over to medium format and I could shoot with um, uh, Firewire. Yes. That was awesome. Very, very fast transfers, very secure. And you couldn't pull the cable out. It was really secure. Then we went to Firewire 800 and that's where the crap actually started to hit the fan because those connectors were a lot faster, but they were also very loose. So you started to work already with tape on your camera. You started to work with uh, other devices to, to make sure that there was no pull on that cable. Then you went to USB. That was awesome. Like USB, great connector. And then the same thing happened. You went to USB micro, USB mini, mm -hmm. and it started to go smaller and smaller. And at one point I said to Enervik, you know what? I think in the future we just have two cables that we put in and it will not work because those ports are so fragile. And then finally USB-C came on the market. And now we have a connector that is super fast, that supports bi-directional, that supports charging. And one of the most important things, it clicks. So that means that we now have a solid connector. Yes. But also over time, you need more speed, you need more power. And starting this year, we started with a new brand called IQ Wire. I'm wearing the cap. The main thing is, you know, without putting any other brands down, because other brands are great, you know, there yeah. are many brands out there like Terra Tools, Area 51, uh, and those are the, the really well-known brands. Don't buy anything from AliExpress, you know, there are many oh, brands no. out there that will show you a cable that's cut through, and you will see that Area 51 and Terra Tools, they just have bigger cables, so that works. But you also have to be realistic. Time continues. Yes. And we found out that 90% of our customers wanted 10 meter USB-C cables. Yes. And nobody on the market sells those. So we started to look into the market and we found a company called IQ Wire. And IQ Wire is a totally new company. It's totally different from all the other brands. They don't start with the pros no, uh, they don't start with the starting point of we need a cable. No. They start with the starting point, what does the photographer need? Mm -hmm. So the cables we are distributing now in the Netherlands and in the Benelux are IQ wire cables. And they are different from other cables because instead of being a cable, we now have a little chip inside that will make a connection and lock that speed. So every other cable always is negotiating speed. These cables lock the speed so you have a very stable and fast connection. Yes. When you look at the cables, you also see boosters inside. And that means that with these cables, we can, without any problem, convert the cables. And this is the big thing. We can convert the cables to any other port. So when you buy a cable and you find out that you have a laptop that uses USB-A, with other brands, you're stuck. With yes. our brand, we just click on a usb converter, put it in the, in the connector, and you are, of course, pulling back to USB 2 speeds, but you can still charge your camera and everything comes through, even live view works. If you have USB mini, we have special converter cables from USB-C female to USB mini. 
And because we have those boosters in, we can literally just convert everything. We tried it out with a uh, medium format camera, 10 meters from our cable and 4.7 meters from another cable, and it still worked. So you have 15 meters thanks to two boosters. We call it the next generation in tether cables because they're faster and stable. Yes. For me, shooting tethered without any brand preferences, whatever you use is great because as soon as you get your images from your camera to a screen, that's the biggest thing ever. You can give me any brand of strobes you want. You can give me any camera, but if you yes. let me shoot without tethering, and this is why we believe in IQ Wire because there are aimed at the future. So you have yes. angled connectors. There's so many things that make the brand different. So that's on location and in the studio for tethering. Now, as soon as we go to location, um, there's a big difference between if I have time. So if I have time, I bring my porties from Hensel. So we have 1200 watts on location with a 14 inch reflector. Uh, yes, 14 inch reflector, so that's huge. So we can literally <laughs> kill the sun. It's a big and bag, by the way. Huh? <laughs> Maybe it's a, it's a big uh, photographer bag. Yeah, it's a it's big, a big bag. So that's why I always bring Anna Week. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's the truth. And with that, I'm able to, and this is what a lot of photographers don't realize, you have a lot of power, but it also means that I can lower the output on my battery. So I recycle faster and I can get way more shots out of it. Now, when I travel... I always have two speed lights with me, Nissan speed lights, because they use uh, lithium ion batteries. So they recycle very fast and just mm -hmm. keep shooting. And we have two devices and we're also the distributor of that. And that's called Rogue. And Expo Imaging is an American company and they built a few years ago, the flash bender. So it's a very flat device that you can bend anyway. You can use a strip light on it and it really focuses the light. And this year they released a new magnetic system and this is what I always use on my strokes now. It's one with the flash bender and one with the magnetic system because then you can change um, gels very quickly. You can stack uh, grids and you have an omnidirectional dome. So that's, I think, on location, the stuff that I use the most. And one thing I want to add to that in the studio, by the way, and we're also distributor for that. So that's, let me explain that first. I'm not promoting the products because we are the distributor of the products. We are distributor of the products because I love the products. Yes. And that's when we started to do, okay, do you have a distributor in the Netherlands? No. Oh, can we please do this? The third brand we are distributing is Click Prop Backdrops. What's in the name? <laughs> it took me a week to get it right. Yeah. And those backdrops are... Jessica, I cannot tell you enough about it. They're awesome because you know it. You make your own backdrops. Yes. A lot of the backdrops don't respond well to strokes. They look great in a catalog, but as yeah. soon as you put strokes under a certain angle, they start to reflect back. Exactly. They start to give you, um, how do you call that in English? Glare. Yes. And you don't want glare in your images. Now, what ClickPro Backdrops does, they have two materials, Pro Fabric and Final, and they use different pigment, uh, pigments, pigments, I mm -hmm. hope that's the right English correction. Pigments. Pigments. <laughs> yes. So when you put strokes on it with gels, the final, for example, really starts to blossom, while the pro fabric is more like an old canvas. It really starts to subdue the colors, and it creates a very, very soft quality of image. So I think in a studio, uh, we always started with seamless, and I really don't like seamless. So we started to paint our walls custom paint. Yes. And I really love that. We've done that for years, but that's so much money. Yes, And then when we found out ClickPro Backdrops, it was like, hey, um, great. So you have the stuff that we love, like old wallpaper, uh, an old wall, uh, whole sets, and you can buy it on, on vinyl and on Pro Fabric, and it just works on a normal paper uh, roll. You can Send carry, it them, to us. carry them with you to your location. Yeah, no problem. Carry. What we do is we take two stands from uh, Monfrotto, those really stands that go up high. Yes. And we use a holder that holds three Pro Fabrics. And they're like 275 wide. So they're the same size as a paper roll. And we have an electric system. So every time we do now a demo, we have three backdrops that I can change with a remote control. And they just photograph like crazy. And I think gear wise, I think that's without a doubt the stuff that really makes it fit for me together. A backdrop to make it interesting. Tether cables to make sure that you see your images. Yes. And everything else is just hardware. But the tether cables the backdrops, and of course, the light modifiers are important. Everything else, guys, it's Gels. just hardware. You can do it with your phone. If you can trigger a strobe with your phone, no problem. That's cool. So can we talk about uh, what's new on Frank's 
Frank Hofdorf's education? Um, yeah, sure. What do you want to know? I want to know, uh, okay, what, what, where can we find you? Uh, do you have online courses in, in yes. person, on site? What, what's new? Do you have a new program coming up? Yeah, we do uh, workshops in our studio in Emmeloord. So those are small group workshops. I don't believe in big groups. We always do five to eight people max. And during yes. Corona, we only do three or four. And only when there's no lockdown, we take it very, very seriously. So we teach twice a week in our studio in Emmeloord on Fridays and Saturdays. And now we do once a week because we're still fighting off the whole Corona and a lot of people are sick. So I can't do two workshops a week. Uh, we do castle workshops in the Netherlands, which we will start up as soon as everything is behind us. And then we do workshops in the castles. That's literally awesome. You can find me on Skillshare and, of course, Kelby One, where we do a lot of... Kelby is my main, main thing. We love Scott, and I think it's the most amazing platform on the world. So we are very much involved with Kelby One. Yes. And we have a very, very active YouTube channel. We try to upload at least two or three videos each week. And where we first did behind-the-scenes vlogs, we are now actually not doing that, but we are literally just filming our setups during the workshops. And then I give tips according to those setups. So the pictures may not be as spectacular as, for example, this is how I shot the king or the queen. It's more like here you see an image that I shot during a workshop. How the heck did I do it? Well, yeah. you place your lights like that. So the images are not spectacular enough to really draw people in. But because of the amount of tips we give, if you put them all together, you get a really great, I, I hope I can call it a masterclass, of all kinds of small tips which you can incorporate in your great images. And sometimes there's an image, of course, like when we do cosplay, those images are awesome. But yes. most of the time, like with light control, it's just a nice portrait, but at least you know how it was lit. So we're very much onto education. And on social media, we share at least one post or two posts each day. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to leave all the information in the, on the description awesome. box where you can find Frank, their socials, everything. And now I would like to close this, like uh, asking you two more questions. What is the work you are most proud of? Um, Difficult question. Yeah, um, um, I don't think it's work. Um, this sounds really weird. And I have to, I have to phrase this very, very carefully. I think the work that we're most proud of is that people trust the brand Frank and Anna Week Doorhof. Yes. Like if we start to build a brand, and we've done that in the past, we can get a brand from literally zero to 55 stores. And that is something that we do because people trust us. And people know that when I tell them this is a great product, like the new rope magnetic system, if I tell you that's a great product, I'm so incredibly proud that people don't go looking for reviews, that mm -hmm. they literally say, if you say it's a great product, send it to me. Yes. And of course, there are still people that say like, yeah, it doesn't really fit my style. That's fine. As long as they don't say it's a crap product. And we never heard that. So I only connect my name to products that are really good. And I think that's the thing that I'm most proud of, that we build a brand that gives people trust. And of course, that's built up with great images. But and the talking trust... Yeah, and talking about that, uh, what do you think about this uh, romanticization about working with brands? Because I have a, a few photographers asking me, photographers asking me, hey, Jessica, how can I do to work with this and that brand? What is your advice about this subject? You know those memes, clients' expectations, what the client got? Uh-huh. Okay. So I will tell you now what you, I'm a Sony ambassador. Let's start with this. So I'm okay. a ClickPro Backdrops global ambassador. I'm a BenQ global ambassador and I'm a Sony global ambassador. So those are three really great brands, right? Yeah, three heavy yeah, titles. Awesome. Do you know that I literally just pay for my camera, that I pay for my lenses, that I don't get anything for free, that even with my name, I have to beg to get a new camera and that I often get it three or four months after the release and they still expect me to do a review, which I decline. For yeah. a very simple reason, I can't do, as a global ambassador, a review about a camera that's already three months on the market and every fool has done a review. So the expectations is often you get a shitload of money. <laughs> you get absolutely nothing. You get a shitload of gear. You get absolutely nothing. You know what you get? Sometimes you get a product in and you look at the product and you go like, I don't know what to do with this, but let me think about it. And then the phone already rings. Did you do the review? Like, Dude, I just opened up the box. Yeah, but did you do the review already? Because we expect a review by tomorrow. 
I go like, how can I ever review something that is so technical in one day? And then you look online and you get it. A lot of those influencers, they get the box in, they open it up and look at this. This is inside. Look at the packaging. Do you care about the packaging? I throw it away. I don't care anything. I want to know how I can use it. And most of all, I want to know how I can use it in creative ways. So not what it's designed for. What can the thing do more? Like when I see a microphone, it's aimed to be speaking in. I get it. But what if I connect that microphone to a tube amp and I start playing my guitar very close to it and I put a little bit of reverb on? Can that microphone get the same characteristics oh, Sorry, as a different microphone? So how can I use it in different ways? You can't do that in one hour after receiving the product. So in essence, your sponsor, sponsor is pushing you constantly to put out new material. So you can't even do your normal work because your sponsor, which doesn't give you anything, they give you a piece of crap gear that maybe retails for 25 euros and they expect you to do a video, a written review and use it in all your workshops. And you pay only half for it, which is there in... So expectations versus reality, it's really bad. Now, when you talk to an American photographer, you will get a totally different story probably. In Europe, even with my name, if I call up a company and I say, I would love to test drive your product, I will send it back after the review. You know that I can't even get products? Because they go like, okay, what's in it for us? So what's in it for us? I have a lot of followers online. We're very active. People trust me. I will review your product for free just because I want to test it out. And maybe afterwards you can give me a nice discount. You know what the discount often is? 10%. So I'm spending 25 hours or 24, 48, whatever hours learning the gear, but learning it more than I would do for myself because I also want to know what it can do for a food photographer. I also want to know what it can do for a wedding photographer because if somebody asks me, can't say I don't know because I'm the expert, right? So I have to know everything about that piece of gear. Then I have to do a video, written review, and what not more. And in the meantime, he's constantly breathing in my neck. Did you do it already? It's a very piece, it's a very expensive piece of gear, and we can sell it. <laughs> did you do it already? And then finally, you did your review. You put it online and you go like, Yeah, but we're not so happy with that one negative point you found. I said, Yeah, but I gave 10 positives. I have to have one negative point. No, no. Can you take that out of the video? No. Oh, okay. And they won't send you anything anymore. You get 10% discount and you, you end up with a piece of gear where you go like, can I really use this? Probably not. So expectations versus reality is totally different. On the other hand, and this I have to point out, we also have sponsors like, for example, BenQ, which are absolutely awesome. Yeah, some sponsors are really yeah. amazing. They, they yeah. pay for our digital classroom together with Rogue, by the way. Rogue is also amazing people. Yes. So Rogue and Expo, uh, Expo Imaging, of course, and uh, BenQ, and also ClickPro Backdrops, by the way, they are so generous. They send and I'm going us to gear. vouch for, for Sigma. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sigma. Well, we try to get it. This is the nice thing. I've been trying to get into Sigma for at least 10 years and they never email me back. When I'm on trade show, they always look at me and go like, yeah, yeah, and you're not interested, interesting for us. And I go like, in the Netherlands, tell me one, peop one person who does more online, who does more education and who shoots more models than me. No, you're not interested enough. And then I see people shooting with Sigma lenses where I go like, yeah, okay, I think you made, <laughs> you made, made Yeah, but the thing is, like, uh, we had in the Spanish podcast, uh, one of the episodes, uh, Edu Lopez, and then he said, look, I work for uh, Fujifilm, and I'm not even an ambassador, but they send me their products and this and that. But the mm -hmm. thing is, like, it's because of my personality. He explained it to yeah. me. You know how Japanese are. They are like really quiet. They want everything like calm. And then you need to be like aligned to their brand. And I'm clear that I'm not a yep. fit for their brand because I'm like super spontaneous and this and that. And my photography is also, you know, all over the place. But they still need him to help them to promote their products. Yeah. And I think that's the main thing that um, <clears throat> I, I think in the Netherlands and in Europe that a lot of companies don't understand how important ambassadors are. Like we are starting brand Rogue now in the, in the Dutch market and the previous distributor didn't do a good job of it. So a lot of people in the Netherlands don't know the brand while every, everywhere else it's sold like crazy. So we have to start with a brand that's been literally destroyed to build it up from zero. Mm -hmm. What we are doing at the moment is we are just giving stuff away for free to people that we love. 
And people that we know that has great work, like for example, Martin Hogeboom, we just send them gear, try it out. If you want to keep it after a month, we will give you a 50% discount. Because if people use the gear, people will see the gear and people will buy the gear. And I think companies like BenQ and uh, Rogue and ClickPro Backdrops really know that every time when I take a picture with their backdrops or edit an image on their monitor, that that will help sales. Yeah. Those are from all the sponsors that we have. And we work with a lot of brands. Those brands are so, so little in the whole market. Mostly it's expectations. Just put it on zero. Just be happy that you can work with a gear if you like it. But you can't earn any money from it. Like, for example, Delkin is an awesome brand. And when they have new cards, they always send me their new cards. And I do a social media post about them. I always shoot with Delkin cards. I'm not one of their ambassadors. But that's a company that just sends out cards. I work for them. <laughs> yeah, I love them. And they don't ask anything in return. I always say, that, yeah, people, you send me those cards. But what do you expect back? And they go like, use the cards. But do I need a video? No. Just use the card. So what do I do? I make a video and make a written review. And I'm even more enthusiastic about it. Yes. And I think, but again, and you know it from your own work experience, I think 90% of the companies, they will send you gear. Yes. They expect a boatload of work from you. And then they take the gear back and you end up with absolutely nothing and a lot of work. And there are only a few companies out there that will literally take care of you as a sponsor. Yes, yes. And those companies, and that's for all the photographers out there that want to have a sponsorship, look in the mirror and listen to this very, very carefully. Look in the mirror. Look straight into your own eyes and ask yourself, seriously, what can I bring to that brand? And if you go, yeah, I'm going to use that gig. No, no. Mm -mm. Look at the mirror and look at it from another person. If that company gives you gear, what can you do back? And I think in 90% of the cases, if you're honest, you will start going back like, okay, I can't do this. In my case, I look in America, what can I do back? Okay, I have a lot of knowledge. I make great images. I have a lot of followers online. People trust me. So yes, I can be an ambassador. And in the end, even for people like me, I can't get into some brands because they are just closed off and they don't want ambassadors. And you know why? Because, and Sigma actually told me that, Frank, we get more than 100 emails each day with people that want to be an ambassador on Europe size. Yes. At one point, we just don't open them anymore and we look for the ambassador. So this is the second tip I give you. If you want to be a sponsored photographer, buy the gear. Yes, you know, spend money in a store, buy the gear, start using the gear. This is how I ended up with Ellingrom. Yes. I bought I I bought the D light. No, sorry. Yes, I bought the D lights. I made a picture of them. The D lights are steel. Ellen Grom saw the picture and emailed me, "Can we use this picture?" I said, "Yes." And after that, I became an Ellen Grom ambassador, and it went the same way with Hansel. I had a friend that worked with Hansel. They loved my work. I was in America for a workshop. There was no Ellen Grom there, so I shot it with Hansel. They filmed it. Hansel saw it. They loved what I did, and they approached me. And at that point, I first went to Ellingrom. I have a new chance. This is what I can do. But I see you guys as family. But I would love to work with this brand. And Ellingrom literally said, whenever you want to come back, you're welcome. Feel free to go with another brand. This is how an ambassador works. You don't yes. destroy the brand that you worked with first because you promoted that brand. So I will never say a bad word about any brand that I've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. That way you build trust. Yes. Now, when you look in the mirror, can you do all that stuff? If you don't, don't even suggest sponsorship. If you can think of all those parts and you go like, yeah, I'm dead, then buy the gear, make great pictures with it, and just start emailing those manufacturers. Like, hey, I'm using your new lens. I absolutely love it. It's great. Look at those pictures. And maybe they will email you back and go like, do you want to work with us? We can give you a 10% discount. Take the 10% discount because the 10% will start to go into 25, will start to go into 50. And at one point, you may be, if you do it really, really well, and you are on a world stage, maybe you will get your gear for free. But even yeah. people like me and Jessica, most of the gear we have, we get with discounts. Without any doubt, I think Jessica will also get a lot of stuff with discount. We get some stuff for free. But don't expect us to be getting a Ferrari for free or whatever. And the stuff that we get for free, 
we actually pay probably double in time that we spend on creating videos and doing yes. free workshops for them because, hey, we gave you a free lens worth of 500 euros. You can do two workshops for us, right? Yeah, that's two days work, including retouching and I don't earn any money. So in yeah. the end, you pay double for your lens. Yeah, but you it know, depends. It depends on the brand. And it really depends also on the people on the brand. There are many exactly. brands that are really well for their ambassadors. And there are also brands that uh, will give you a one day notice and they will just take everything away. And that's happened. And well, that's a shame. You know, you cry, you pick the stuff up and you continue and you never say a bad word and you just build something that's better, newer and bigger. Exactly. So three things, three things, three things <laughs> you wish you've known before becoming a photographer. Ah, uh, how much fun it is. Most of all, how much fun it is, because then uh -huh. I would have started way earlier. Uh -huh. um, second one, how difficult it is, because I would have prepared certain things differently, because it is very, very hard. And the third thing, I, I think one of the most important things that I learned in all these years with photography is don't ever, ever do something that's not you. When I'm on a stage, I'm Frank. When I'm talking to you, I'm Frank. The only difference between Frank, between you and me as friends, is that the Frank, when the camera is off, can sometimes make a joke that is not really well for educational part or can say crap, for example. With you, I know I can say crap, but in a Kelby video, I can't say it. So that's the only thing. When I'm on a stage, I'm a little bit more filtered. I'm a little bit more careful about who's in front of me yes and i think that's the most important thing don't start to dress up and wear funny hats or do weird stuff that that's not you because i have a career now of over 15 years in photography and being on stages if i would have done a, a show look, look at kelby kelby right when he's on stage and he's off stage he's a mirror he's exactly the same when you talk to him oh that's the thing be gentle to people. Never, ever screw somebody over because it's a small market. It's a really, really small market. Yes. Be kind. So when something happens to you, don't go into warfare. Go into warfare with roses. In other words, be nice. Be a gentleman. Even if inside you're blowing up with hatred, never show that. But always go like, yes, of course, it's great. But think about this. And that way, if you're honest to yourself and you will never think about, oh, maybe I should have done it differently, you will have a long lasting career. But everybody that starts with a lie and that will start to be arrogant, those guys will stop shooting immediately almost because people will figure it out. You know, it's YouTube, it's social media. Our lives are literally for everybody to see. So yes. be yourself. And if you're an asshole, do something else. Go work at McDonald's. <laughs> if you're a nice guy, maybe think about photography because people will literally find out your end game. And my end game is building trust and helping other people progress and inspire other people. And I think if that's honest, you will have a very, very long lasting career. If it's not honest and you're only in it for the money, forget about it. Photography is not for you. Oh my God, Frank, thank you so much for this beautiful interview. You are so honest and open. And so, you know, you have a big heart and, and I cannot be more thankful for this master, sorry, for this master class you just gave ah, us. Thank you I'm so going to much. show all the reference on the YouTube uh, episode for those who are like listening. I'm going to show all the reference uh, Frank uh, gave us on this episode and I'm going to leave all the info where you can find Frank. Frank, thank you so much. You're more than welcome. <laughs>